Get ready to enter a brave new world with your host, Vasant Dar. Brave New World is supported by the Center for Data Science, or CDS, at NYU. If your organization is interested in engaging with CDS through student projects, please email cdsindustry at nyu.edu. For more color on the podcast and additional commentary, please subscribe to my newsletter at basantdar.substack.com. Hello, and welcome to Brave New World. My guest today is paleontologist Peter Ward. Peter is a professor at the University of Washington and the author of numerous books, including Rare Earth and A New History of Life. Given the vastness of geological time, which spans billions of years, I'm blown away by how accurately Peter is able to describe extinctions on Earth and explain the resurgence of life following them. By accurately, I mean to within a few thousand years. And it's sobering to read that life on Earth is headed for ultimate extinction and to think about ways we might prolong it. On that note, Peter, welcome to Brave New World. I am delighted to have you on the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Well, you know, Peter, you've had uh, quite a career. I'd love to hear your story. You know, what, what took you into paleontology? You know, in, in your book, A New History of Life, you talk about the fact that we've actually learned a lot in this century, which I found really intriguing, you know, considering the timescales at which, you know, you make predictions and the timescales at which you analyze history. So I was really curious about that. So I'd like to sort of head in that direction. But first, just tell us how you got into this field. Well, the statement I've had quite a career is a euphemism for I'm old. <laughs> that I've been doing this for quite a long time. And yet, it's wonderful to be a student of the rock record. And when we start looking at what geological time is and the vastness of that, it, it really makes what I call a long career, not very long at all. We're just so ephemeral. There was always that part of it that got me interested in the rock record and the history of life, the antiquity of it all. I remember reading these great books by Roy Chapman Andrews, all about dinosaurs, and he was the paleontologist from the American Museum in the 1920s, was the very first to take an expedition to the Gobi Desert, where they found the first dinosaur eggs. And these wonderful books when you're a little boy, the sense of adventure was fabulous. So it was dinosaurs, like so many of us, that got us into us. And unfortunately for me, or fortunately for me, unlike so many others, I never grew out of it. So I'm still in the middle of that phase. Dinosaurs are interesting, but so much more about the history of life is interesting as well. That's fascinating. Tell us more uh, about... You know, what we really learned in this century, that's significant. Well, what's scaring me isn't, there is a, an enormous amount that we've learned, but how much we haven't learned. And what I'm really trying to cope with now is how life started in the first place. I still think that's perhaps one of the great unsolved mysteries, perhaps one of the greatest of all scientific mysteries. How does life start from non-life? Actually, what is life? So many, so many NASA definitions that goes on and on and on. Uh, the great Edwin Schrodinger said that life is a substance that takes negative entropy. I love this idea. Entropy, of course, is disorder, and life takes energy and produces anti-disorder, or order, as he would call it. Life is a substance that is capable of evolving, of reproducing, and of getting that energy. Those are the three simple ones that NASA uses. But more and more people are looking at life as a series of processes, highly complex chemical processes, that the more we look at it, for instance, I was contemplating the difference between the very large and the very small. Let's say we want to make a robot. So a robot is artificial life, at least in terms of all the movies and all the good stuff. Here's Robbie the robot, whatever, walking around, talking around. They're always big, clunky things. And we've got gears in them. And then in the Android stories, when you tear the skin off, you see these long cables and all that stuff, all the robot stuff. 
it's pretty easy to build something big like a robot. Now take all that stuff, that giant robot, and have to miniaturize it. Think about the size, how tiny a bacterium is. It's way more complex than that robot. It's doing all this stuff with molecules at the molecular size. That's what's scaring me. How do you evolve situations where you can build these itty-bitty tiny robots? And that's what non-life to life had to entail. And why I'm really spooked about this is I'm writing a follow-up to my book, Rare Earth, which with Don Brownlee we wrote in 2000. And surprisingly, you mentioned I have a long career. That was a book for the public. And yet, if anything I've ever done, it has the most citations. It is remains a major cited scientific work. It was never meant to be that, but it was the cry saying that, oh, the aliens of Star Wars, we should find that right away. We'll go to the nearest star, and we'll have a bar there, and all the aliens will be sitting around drinking what they drink. No. And the thing, the reason I'm bringing this up is that the rare earth hypothesis we came up with was that life will probably be widespread in the cosmos. It's going to be all over everywhere. But alien life, intelligence, complex animals even, not so much. Oh, it's pretty simple. Uh, but it remains a certainly a conversation piece. In astrobiology, people know it. it. It's the thought. It's the antithesis to aliens everywhere. But increasingly now, the more I've looked and the more we've studied and trying to understand the history of life on this planet, I'm not sure anymore how easy it is for life to form any place or that when we go to Mars, we'll find microbes or Enceladus or anywhere else in the solar system. Well, not only that, how about the 30 nearest planets or star systems? Microbial life we thought might be easy and maybe not. Maybe these tiny little things are much harder. I absolutely reject the idea we are alone in the cosmos. But I certainly am beginning to worry about we're going to find microbes, microbial equivalents here, there, and everywhere. I'm not so sure about that. Now, there's evidence that there was life on Mars. Is that right? And they... No, not yet. No? Nope. Uh, there's a little bit of methane. There's the recent evidence in Saturn's moons that there are complex organic compounds. But let's think about a complex organic compound, like a hydrocarbon. is a string of carbons with maybe a nitrogen and a sulfur and a bunch of hydrogens on it and some oxygen, maybe. Do you know how far from life that is? I mean, you're talking, you know, it, it's hard to come up with a comparison. No, I, I, we have not found evidence of life anywhere. Well, we haven't gotten to these places. Maybe we're wrong. Maybe we'll put a drill core down in Mars and bring it back. And certainly the sample return missions to Mars are very expensive. But I also asked my students yesterday, and I'll see them again today. I said, okay, think of a machine, and you can fly that machine and have it land anywhere on Earth. And you can use that machine, tell it to find a fossil and dig up that fossil and carry it back, right? So we know life is just covered, and this, this planet has so much life on it. We know there's a lot of fossils on this planet. But a robot finding fossils, it's hard for we professionals to find fossils. Mm -hmm. The fossil record is very scattered. And to bring a rock back with evidence of life in it, because that's what you're asking the Mars machines to do, right? Mm -hmm. They're not going to bring back life itself, highly improbable. They're hoping to bring back any fossil microbe. That's what they're looking for. Now, is there evidence that there was flowing water on Mars at one point? Yes. And so this is the hope, that if there's water, life will follow. Right. You know, maybe not. Increasingly, as we look at where life formed on this planet, how it formed, what are the conditions necessary? So what's the best theory of how life originated on Earth? There is no best theory. There is no good theory at all. Really? None of them are worth a damn. Uh, Hydrothermal yeah. vents. Yeah, how about yeah. warm how about, little how, ponds? How, right, right. How, how about up in the clouds? How about clay layers? I know them all. None of them make sense to me. And as we get more and more into chemistry, none of them make sense there. If the earliest life on Earth was what we called ribose life, we call it the RNA world. 
So RNA is the piece of our genetic machinery that runs around. Our DNA is the master. The RNA are the slaves. They have to run over and grab pieces of amino acids and build pro do all that stuff, right? Well, the precursor to DNA was probably RNA, and it was self-replicating. And the, the beautiful Nobel Prize winning study of, of 20 years, 30 years ago now, is that ribose and RNA is capable, RNA molecules can self-catalyze. So not only do they have an ability to replicate themselves, they can do it with their own chemical properties. So that was the breakthrough that people thought that the first life on Earth would have been naked RNA molecules, building themselves, replicating themselves, repeating over and over and over. The problem with that is how do you get the energy to do that? Well, they could pick up a little bit, But you need to put them in a cell. So you need to have a genetic system stuck in a cell that has a separate machinery to get energy. But they still need to originate somehow, right? Yeah. And, and so that's what I'm asking. I actually thought that there was a good theory, but so I'm a little discouraged that you're saying there isn't oh, one. Oh, it's very discouraging. And what we're seeing, the best what I've seen yet um, comes from the idea that if you go out in deserts, there is a... I'm so old. There was a program called, many years ago, Ronald Reagan, the future president, was shilling soap for a Western called Death Valley Days. And what he would do is get up and extol the virtue of borax soap. It's borax, the best soap your laundry will ever want, and I'll be president someday. Well, he never said that, right? Reagan did a lot what of a selling, career that guy had. Yeah, yeah. And the thing is that uh, borates, minerals that are borates, in fact, are full of phosphorus. And borax soap is a way to get ribose. And ribose is a sugar. Like so many sugars, the problem with the ideas of, say, life forming in a hydrothermal vent is that the temperatures are so high. And many chemists have said you can't form any sort of ribose-based life If you're at temperatures that are boiling, and we know that many of these way above boiling, and we have microbes that can live in it, but we're not talking about, we're talking about microbes that already have a very sophisticated genetic system or chemically able to deal with heat. But we're not talking about things where little pieces of chemicals are coming together. When you boil the hell out of this stuff, it rips apart. You need stability. You can't have high temperature. So more and more, we're looking at the origin of life at temperatures that make us comfortable. But once you find those sorts of temperatures, how do you bring all this stuff together? Another way to think about this, think of the billions of dollars that various national science foundations have put into the ability or the hope to build life in a test tube. I mean, great chemists, Nobel Prize winning chemists, thousands of chemists. People have been working on this for decades. We're miles away from it. We can bring little pieces of RNA together and get them to grow three or four or five units and then fall apart. We are so far away from artificially producing life in a test tube because the problem is the miniaturization. We can't crack that yet. And so trying to think about where on earth it may have happened, I'm thinking more and more, the best guess that I've seen is that you've got tidal systems and that we're looking now at tides going up, tides going down. When a tide goes out, a muddy bottom is dehydrates in the heat, let's say. So you're condensing things, you're dehydrating things, you're letting chemicals be pulled together through dehydration. You then have water come back in, brings in some chemicals that maybe weren't there, then they dehydrate. And increasingly, even in the last year, I saw pretty nice articles suggesting that when you splash, say you have this system, and then you splash, which waves do, tiny little bubbles of water go up into the air, and some concentration takes place there where you're bringing together amino acids and ribose and can produce RNA. And then that thing falls back down and falls apart. I mean, that's the level we're at. We, we After all this money and all this time, we're so far away from understanding it. And I guess this long story is that it would have been really hard to form life on this planet. So you start thinking about Why hasn't life been forming all along? Well, I was actually going to say that 
And yet life has been pretty relentless, right? I mean, you talk about 10 extinctions. Oh, once you get it, sure, it's very relentless. But right. it's, it's getting it might be the single hardest part. So, so what you're saying is despite all those extinctions, some life persisted. Oh, life, life is, it's, it's, once you've got it, it, you can't get rid of it. It's like a bad infection, right? All the antibiotics, think of the mass extinctions as antibiotics, right? Well, the, some two or three microbes always get through. You, you almost never kill it all. There are slight little survivors that just have the right chemical situation to do it. Life on Earth has been that way. So it's like COVID, which is going to be around uh, us forever. Yeah, yeah. Once yeah. once a planet gets infected with life, it's very difficult to remove that life. I mean, just the fact that we can find microbes so many kilometers down beneath the surface. I mean, not far from here, eastern Washington, we have basalt. And Hanford, the nuclear power agency, of course, is polluting the hell out of that place. And all that escape plutonium is and you're there. So they've been coring rocks for years. And in these deep cores, they find microbes living way down there in the rocks, in the voids of basalt. Microbes are breaking down little bits. There's hydrogen down there. They use hydrogen to fuel themselves. And they're living so far. It's called the deep microbial biosphere. Tommy Gold, the great scientist, discovered this years ago, 30, 40, 50 years ago. And all that stuff, say we get hit by a gigantic asteroid, let's not do a little one that kills the dinosaurs. Let's get killed by something 50 kilometers in diameter, 10 times the size of the dinosaur killer. The surface life is definitely, especially if it hits the ocean, it's like an autoclave. The oceans evaporate and it sterilizes the surface. It doesn't touch the deep stuff. So, Peter, we started with my observation that we've actually learned a lot in this century. So, what is it that we've learned in the last 20 years that's especially revealing about life on Earth? Um, we're knowing more and more about the early Earth. We're knowing the conditions. And what's so hard about understanding the early Earth is that there are more, a greater volume of pristine, earliest Earth rocks on the Moon that came from Earth. Now, early Earth, you're talking 3 billion years? I'm talking, take? no. I'm talking the Earth started at 4.56. Right. So we have this Hadean era, and there are no good Hadean rocks on the planet that have not been melted or squished or me just metamorphosed. So pristine rocks over 4 billion years old are rare to vanishingly rare to not existent at all. We really don't start finding rocks that are really good rocks, still about 4 billion to 3.8 billion. But starting at 4.2 billion years ago and ending at 3.8 billion years ago was something called the heavy bombardment. And that was all the garbage from the formation of the solar system comes blasting down. There, we had pieces of the solar system the size of Texas hitting the planet over and over and over. You could see a situation where life formed was then snuffed out. Life forms is snuffed out. The Earth after this early bombardment is a totally different place than before it. And a lot of pretty good thinkers are thinking the conditions that led to the formation of Earth were permanently erased by and after this bombardment system. Life may have gotten a foothold, may have lived in these rocks, but after the heavy bombardment, the chemistry of the Earth is so radically changed that life can't form again. The chemistry of the planet changes. We know we had a reducing atmosphere that changes to an oxidizing atmosphere later with oxygen. But the problem being that we have so few rocks of the great age, understanding the chemistry and natural systems where Earth f first formed life is very difficult. So, so coming back to the question, so what, what is it that we've learned? You, you said we've uh, learned about the early Earth. So what, which period are you talking about? Well, one of the first things we're trying to understand, when does plate tectonics start? When do we have these shifting movements? But I think the most interesting aspect, understanding the early Earth, and again, I want to go right back to this idea, and I'm sorry I keep coming back to this, but it's what's on my mind, is the fact we have this great big moon. And trying to understand the early Earth, we have to understand the Earth before we had a moon and after we had a moon. Because what we've learned fairly recently, and this was interesting just three months ago at the 
someone found a piece of the moon forming planet that hit us. So our moon didn't form in gentle acquiescence around the early Earth. The Earth was hit by a, a planet. The Earth was smaller. It was hit by a planet the size of Mars. This is called Thea. And this was, again, I think at 4.4 billion years ago, maybe 4.45. But within a billion years of the formation of the Earth, another planet comes in. And we know the planets are moving around quite a bit back then because you have these Jupiters. Jupiter is a big, nasty bully, pushes planets in, pushes planets out. It very well could be that a smaller planet was pushed out of orbit, maybe further away from us. Maybe it was inside Earth's orbit, but it hits us. And that hit has been beautifully modeled. Even recently, in the last six months, another new study came out. So when that hit takes place, I mean, both planets pretty much disaggregate, and they do this beautiful dance. You could go online and moon-forming collision, and you just see these blobs, and they have these fabulous commuter simulations. So, Peter, what really blows my mind about what you're saying is that we have these kinds of theories that you're stating with some precision, right, despite the timescales involved, right? And in your book, I noticed that um, with recent methods, we can actually get some very fine resolution, right, to the order of tens of thousands of years, which, oh, yes. in, which oh, in your the, scale is the, is the dating systems are fabulous. So, so, so what what is it that's made this possible? Because this just boggles my mind. I mean, I've heard of carbon dating, but what's been sort of the paradigm shift in terms of the methods that have allowed you to? sort of make these sort of bold conjectures and actually validate them? Instrumentation. And one of the things that at least the American National SAS Foundation has been very good at is that entire divisions are based entirely on let's build more instruments. There are the Keck group. I guess they're at Caltech or out of Caltech, but... Keck is, has huge amounts of money, too. And they give every university that I've been involved with, the big ones, um, there's always a Keck proposal going out for giving us a great big piece of instrumentation. Give us a big million dollar, $10 million, $50 million hunk of equipment. It's the giant instrumentation that has allowed such interesting movement going forward. Um, mass spectroscopes, really the ability to look at individual atoms and their isotopes that's so powerful in understanding biology i mean it's the use of the instruments that came out of atomic physics and the building the bombs a lot of that stuff got co-opted into biology in beautiful ways in such ways that the power of these things um we're looking now at lasers that can break down organic materials into individual little pieces um, one of the greatest coolest studies in my own area, I'm very interested in <laughs> lots of things, but one of which is the chambered nautilus, and I've just come back from a trip studying that beautiful animal. I mean, the, the beauty of that animal is how has this thing lasted 500 million years? What is it? I mean, just as you look at old people, 100-year-old people, what is it that allowed your to live into 100? And the stories are fabulous, of course. I drink every day, cigarettes every day. Oh, no, no, good time, blah, blah, blah. Probably chance, right? There's a lot of chance that goes on here. But a group was able to take a nautilus shell and fire in a beautiful, gigantic instrumentation center uh, out of University of Wisconsin. They fired high energy at this and were able to, to do oxygen isotope analyses and Usually what I do, I do these, is I get a big hunk of shell, and it's, you know, a few grams of shell, and they put it in the machines, we turn it into a powder, we vaporize it, take the CO2 that comes out, and we look at the ratio of oxygen 18 to 16. Years ago, this was shown, You, if you get this ratio, you can tell the temperature at which a shell was formed at. Well, these guys use this laser, and they were able to break down an hour in the life of a nautilus, an hour of an animal, in these cases that had lived 20 years ago after the shell was found, hour by hour of its life living in the ocean 20 years ago. 
I can look at, when I get my finest sample, I'm looking at maybe a month of its growth. They're looking at hours in this thing. Wow. Yeah. And that's, it's that sort of level of sophistication that the giant instrumentation programs going forward. Other breakthroughs, the one I talked about, the formation of the moon has brand new in terms of my question going back to that is I don't see how life, any life on this planet could have survived that collision. But the most interesting thing to me is after that collision takes place, we have a system where life is able to stay alive on this planet because of constant temperature. I may mention of plate tectonics. Plate tectonics is something that keeps our systems going. It's really a planetary thermostat. It lets us keep a constant temperature. Say more about that. Sure. What happens is we have lots of volcanoes, and volcanoes keep blasting CO2 in the atmosphere. Look at Venus. Venus was a volcanic planet where all kinds of CO2 went into the atmosphere. It got hotter and hotter, and finally got so hot, all its oceans, it probably was like Earth, early oceans, evaporated away. Venus is now a place that has a CO2 atmosphere, almost nothing else, and a whole lot of heat, 700 degrees centigrade on the surface. It lost its thermostat. So a volcano goes off here, and it gets hotter. Uh, it gets hotter and hotter, but the thing about the heat is that we have rocks, volcanic rocks, that when they get hot, they weather. Weathering is a process where a rock is exposed to carbon dioxide, but it's also exposed to water vapor, and it begins to attack specific minerals, clay minerals, and they change composition, and in so doing, they pull CO2 out of the atmosphere. We have these minerals, and we have these volcanoes coming up, and we have this lava. The, the plate tectonics that we have today, big plates of the ocean struck down. They have calcium carbonate diving down. It melts. It goes up. It produces CO2. It gets hotter from the CO2. The CO2 affects the surface rocks, and it makes it cooler. Without the plate tectonics, this cycle doesn't happen. Petrotonic starts on Earth after this moon forming collision. I months years ago I worked for a scientific literary agency, the Brockman Group. John Brockman was the agent of all the big scientific people. And I've since moved on, but he was the agent for Rare Earth. But he had this little, he had something called the Edge Foundation. I admit mean, it still exists, and a big newsletter. And he, he asked all his authors, you know, all of us, lots of us. Give me one sentence, most pithy sentence you could about questions you would ask the universe. And I was at in the throes of writing Rare Earth at the time. And I said, well, I would ask what percentage of planets that we call Earth-like actually have plate tectonics out in the cosmos? Because one of the things we suggested in Rare Earth, that without plate tectonics, you're not going to have long-term stability of climate sufficient to to get to, you got to have a very long time for biology to go from a microbe to a radio astronomer. And we remember Carl Sagan said that was the definition of intelligence. You could build a radio telescope. Uh, I wondered at the time, would Shakespeare be thought to be intelligent? Does a sonic count? But that's irrelevant, right? We don't care about that. But nevertheless, this moon collision would have caused the thicknesses of the upper layers of the Earth to change composition. And just as I mentioned earlier, a big slab of that early planet has been found deep down in the Earth. So we have, we got, we became bigger. Mars is dead. Mars doesn't have enough radioactivity, enough material within it. Venus is dead because it was too close to the sun. It got too hot. It got a very thick crust. We are not dead because of extremely thin crust. Plate tectonics can only take place if you have a very thin crust sitting on a liquid mantle. How much of our crust thickness is a consequence of that moon-forming collision? 
It may be that complex life on this planet isn't the moon itself. The moon, sure, the moon has effects on us. We could talk about those. But it was the formation that led to a big moon because there's nothing else in our solar system that has a planet our size and a moon around it. Venus doesn't have it. Mars doesn't have a big moon. How often do you see that? Saturn, Saturn does it. Well, Saturn, but Saturn doesn't, it's a holy, it's not an Earth-like planet. It's not a solid planet. It's a big gas ball. It has big moons, yes. But it doesn't, it isn't a planet where life could form that also has a moon with it. So, Peter, your sort of larger theory here is that I guess life on Earth has been a combination of, you know, sort of ecological and evolutionary stresses, you know, that sort of occur periodically. So what role do both of those play in life? You know, and, and, and I'm asking because I actually got started in AI with genetic algorithms kind of early, you know, uh, as sort of computational models and, you know, grew up studying Darwinian natural selection. And I realized that that's really a small piece of the history of life, that evolution takes place in the larger context. So... Just Can you just flesh out your theory here and briefly tell us why it's led to all these extinctions and then the resurgence of life? And as you point out, sometimes even more diversity, you know, after the extinction. Well, that's always been one of the big questions. And I, I was able earlier in life to have conversations with some really sensationally smart people, one of whom was Frank Drake, uh, the Drake equation. People have said that two iconic equations of the 20th century, Einstein and the Drake equation. The Drake equation was the first estimate, Frank Drake and Carl Sagan. Uh, Frank Drake then formed SETI, Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, as you well know. Mm -hmm. But the Drake equation was an, an effort to try to understand and make some sort of guess based on science of how many intelligent civilizations are out there. And so Drake and I were talking, it was a great honor for me to talk to him, and we were talking about mass extinctions. And he said, well, mass extinctions, I mean, they aren't so bad, you think about it, we probably needed them. And that was an argument, and it's an argument I think you're alluding to now. And the question to us was, how many do you need? And people have wrestled with this. You know, we had five or six of these big ones in the last 500 million years, what I still and you alluded to think is, is terrible is that we keep talking about the sixth extinction and utterly ignore all the extinctions that happened before animals come along. Mm -hmm. Now, we are animal chauvinists because we're animals. Right. But really, it was the major turnovers far earlier that directed, I think, and put the earth on the path that finally did allow animals to appear. But let's say we are living on a planet just like earth, but we are right near the center of the galaxy. We're not way off on the edge as we are here. And we're surrounded by stars much closer to us. And so the night sky would be just this light show of bright nearby stars. It'd be nothing like we see now or the stars. I mean, the brightest thing you see is in a northern hemisphere is Sirius. What is it, a magnitude of minus two or something? Venus is so bright. But let's imagine that everywhere around you, you have stars as bright as Venus or brighter. Well, they're close to you. And things that are close have gravity. And the worst thing that can happen, we think, to a planet is you get hit by a comet. Now, the asteroid that killed the dinosaurs probably was an asteroid. Maybe it was a piece of comet. But it was hitting, it was speeding at, say, 20 kilometers a second. But comets, if you pull a comet out of an Oort cloud and push it in, another star comes very close to you and pulls a lot of your Oort cloud out. A lot of those comets are going to hit your planet. One 10-kilometer asteroid reset the nature of life on Earth. What if you were hit every million years by a 20-kilometer comet? Well, you don't go very long before you've pretty much gone back to microbial life. Just accident after accident after accident. And you wonder, I hate to use this analogy, but look what's going on in, in Ukraine. And they're being hit by missiles over and over and over. Or what's happening in the Middle East? When you keep hitting a city with missiles over and over and over, how long does it take until order completely dissolves and that the living systems, the sewer systems, the electricity, all the stuff that keeps human civilization going just break down? Well, think of planets like that. 
if you have mass extinctions, if you have a worlds that are just constantly under struggle from whatever, and it doesn't just have to be comets. I mean, there are other things that could cause these extinctions. What if you have flood basalts over and over and over where you're getting huge amounts of CO2 that are causing your biosphere to permeate extinction at 251 million years ago? A gigantic flood basalt does this. So the end of the Triassic, the same thing. The, these things, planets are on a knife edge to keep their life alive. So you've got this uh, hypothesis called the media hypothesis, which I guess if I were to try and summarize it, says that life could be its own enemy. Well, certainly, what the thing about the mass extinctions. The, yeah, right. Oh, yes, no, no, yes. Go ahead. Yeah. And I, I'll give some background to this. Um, my mother was a great classical scholar, but she was born at a time where women really didn't get to go to universities. So she wanted to be an archaeologist, and she instilled in her kids, think about classical literature, read the Greeks. And I did. And one of the great books influence on me was the story about Jason and the Golden Fleece. And there was a fabulous scholar named Robert Graves who wrote many, many books. He was one of these British dons who finally got sick of England and moved to the Mediterranean. But one of his books was Hercules, My Shipmate, Story of Jason and the Golden Fleece. And Medea was a woman that he captures, Jason, seeking the fleece. There were some funny movies made by it in the 1960s. Medea was the bad mother. Jason turns out to be such a bad husband. She takes the two children that she had with Jason and slaughters them with a knife. Here's her children. Mother, please, no. She kills them both. And I started thinking about this in response to the Gaia hypothesis, where so many have suggested that there is some, some sort of systems on Earth that will save us. You know, humans will screw it up, but Gaia will step in and say, you bad children, I'll fix you, the planet's alive. And the entire New Age sort of mantra in religion is, brings up Gaia over and over. I wanted a response to that. Life could be its own worst enemy in the mass extinctions. The killer or the microbes. We kill advanced life in these mass extinctions, and we do it in such a way that it messes with the entire oxygen-producing systems. And if you reduce oxygen, you start getting microbes that build poisons, hydrogen sulfide. And so we're looking at times when things get so hot, it's the flood basalts, it's carbon dioxide that starts to kill, but it's microbes that do the actual killing of the animals. So of the extinctions that you've listed, the 10 extinctions, how many of these have been chance events where something just hits the planet and, you know, there's a reset versus, let's say, life itself Creating just, an environment that destroys it. Just one. Just one, you mean? The end of the dinosaurs is yeah. the only one That's where the life isn't the major force. And let's think of another example. I'm teaching my invertebrate paleontology, and today we're going to talk about the Cambrian explosion, that amazing period starting at 543, 543 million years ago, ended about 500. All the phyla, a phylum is a, is a, is a taxonomic grouping the way you classified life, that denotes a specific body plan. Our body plan chordates is we have this cord, and we we personally surround it with a backbone, but there's chordates that don't have a, a, a bones around it. But nevertheless, there's 35 or 36 individual specifically different groups of animals. Think of mollusks, think of arthropods, think of worms that you look at them and say, oh, that's really different. You know, look, a lobster doesn't look like an oyster. And look at the characters. You can break them down. Well, all of these major groupings appear in this short lived explosion of stuff. But what came before it was a major, major time of glaciation, a snowball earth where the earth froze. And the Earth froze, and in that freezing, it produced probably one of the biggest mass extinctions of all time. What was on that 700 million year old ocean planet was a world filled with kelp, a world filled with protozoans, didn't have any animals, but it had all kinds of other stuff, lots of life. 
And then the oceans freeze. The lands get covered with ice. Stuff just dies. Why did that happen? In a planet that has lots and lots of volcanism, and as we go back in time, there's more volcanism the older you go back in history, because the Earth has been cooling over time. The amount of radioactive material, there would have been way more volcanoes 700 million years ago. How in the world do you freeze a planet when you have more volcanic stuff? Life did it. Life keeps evolving stuff. We are on a knife edge, and we humans are... We are skating on that knife with what we're doing to the atmosphere. Carbon dioxide, the narrow limits of carbon dioxide, is such a powerful molecule. You know, I tell my kids, kids, <laughs> my college students, you know, think about we now have 420 or 430 carbon dioxide molecules in the atmosphere, ppm, parts per million. Mm -hmm. If we just doubled that, the planet is going to completely radically change and go back to what we had in the Mesozoic. We're talking about just doubling the number, a very small number of molecules out of millions. That's how powerful CO2 is. Well, life back 700 million years ago figured out a way for plants. Plants, we could have conquered the earth. Let's go on land. We've been in water all this time. We've been floating around. What do we do? We take CO2, we produce oxygen. That's cool. More oxygen, better planet, right? Once plants get on land, they start pulling more CO2 out of the atmosphere than the volcanoes could replace. CO2 levels drop. It gets colder and colder and colder, and it's a positive feedback. Right now, we're in a positive feedback. The warmer it gets, the warmer it gets. Every year, we have less ocean ice. Less ocean ice means less sun is reflecting back into space. And in fact, what it's doing is being absorbed by seawater. The planet gets warmer. But think about the opposite. What if it was getting a little bit colder every year? The Arctic ice grew by a 1,000 square miles every year. Albedo, the reflectivity of a planet. Ice reflects. It's white. It throws all that sunlight back. Planet gets colder. More ice. Planet gets colder. Simply plants figuring out how to live on land, this evolutionary breakthrough, creates this ice world. And the ice world kills off a whole bunch of stuff. It finally, finally does melt. It finally does slowly melt. And again, we have to thank the volcanoes for that. So much is dead that there's no plants pulling CO2 out of the atmosphere anymore. The volcanoes are still spewing away. It warms, it melts. And out of that comes the Cambrian explosion. So you've got this new rejuvenation taking place, but it's entirely different organisms that happened from before. The mass extinctions completely reset. I mean, you're, it's like you're having a play and you're murdering all the actors. And then you want a separate Shakespeare play. You want to call, I mean, where's that great actor that could, could play Hamlet? Oh, we killed him last time. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Bring in somebody new. So, Peter, one of the charts in your book is showing the CO2 levels. You know, as you've stated, they've been like going down. And I don't know where the x-axis started, but I'm assuming that was 7 billion years ago. And... So if CO2 has been going down, 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 and it's now, you know, I, I don't know, 403 percent yeah. or something like that. So clearly if it goes to zero, we're in trouble, isn't it? Well, it'd be long before we go to zero, we're in trouble. Yeah. So, it, so then wouldn't it be a good thing for us to actually produce CO2 and greenhouse gases to kind of maintain the level of CO2? Yeah, and that's the last chapter of the book you mentioned, the Medea Hypothesis, which is, again, another one of the great Peter Ward worst sellers. But you know, we're, <laughs> never sold many copies, but, uh, I mean, word gets out, so, sometimes a few of these ideas. And what I tried to say at the end of that, if this whole idea, the Medea Hypothesis is that, you know, who was it, the famous saying, life will find a way? Well, that was in Jurassic Park, you know, life... Life right. will find a way, yeah. Dr. Malcolm. Well, I sort of bastardized that. To life will find a way to kill itself off. Yeah. And that if life is going to form on other planets, we might expect that it gets its, in its own way and in not very good ways. And the only out is intelligence. And that goes right back to what you mentioned. 
we know how to fix this. We have a long-term drop in carbon dioxide. Well, why is that? Well, it's simple. Life. Life has figured out how to build skeletons. You need CO2 to do it. There are so many more organisms now that use carbon dioxide to build their skeletons, their shells, plankton, all the way up to giant animals, clams, giant clams, all that stuff. There's more and more of it. It keeps pulling out more and more CO2. Plant life keeps expanding all over the place. More and more plants keeps pulling out more and more CO2. What do we do? Well, we also find that the continents are getting bigger and bigger and bigger. That's another consequence of plate tectonics. And so we keep locking up CO2 that is now in rocks instead of letting it recycle. Not so bad that these little animals make carbon dioxide. As long as you can subduct it down, melt it, and put it back into the cycle. But when you build a giant white mountain, like you'll see in the Alps or the Apennines, right through the center of Italy, there's beautiful white Apennine mountains. It's all limestone. Or go to Banff and you look at the Rockies and these giant white limestone mountains. That's where all the CO2 went. It's in limestone built by organisms, we can easily liberate that. Well, we're liberating it now with our cars. Yeah. But I see humans going forward as understanding we need to balance CO2. We can easily do it. Well, politically, we can't easily do it. Scientifically, we can easily do it. We can fix everything going on right now. We say, stop using this. Don't burn this. The complete cap on CO2, we want this level to keep where we are. Nobody gets away from anything but that. Whatever it takes politically, civilization-wise, it's so got to be the level. You're saying scientifically it's possible. Oh, absolutely. And there will be a media effect everywhere. The only way out is if there is an intelligence that arises on the planet. Otherwise, life will eventually kill itself off into so are we like worry? Are we overly worrying about green uh, greenhouse emissions um, at the moment? Well, yes and no. The big yes to me is that we can fix this, and it's it's going to be something that takes place. For instance, sea level rise, I wrote a book about that. It's something people don't worry about because you can't see it in a year. Nevertheless, if we were to have a breakdown of some of the great glaciers in Antarctica where you have a 10-foot sea level rise, people would get pretty worried in a hurry. But in our lifetimes, it's so slow that it's not something that people are going to worry about. And yet, to me, the big problems are the exchange of nuclear weapons. And that happens when political systems break down. And the breakdown of political systems happens when people starve. And I'm seeing climate change is leading to major disruptions in agriculture. So when we have giant civilizations that can't feed themselves, that also now have nuclear weapons, that is a way for complex life on this planet to be exterminated. So as long as we don't do weird things like that, like kill each other with nuclear weapons, so if we preclude those kind of existential threats, are we then sort of okay? We, we can figure it out. I'm we pretty sure we will figure it out. Yeah. But uh, the, the wild card is the fact that we've now built the ability to wipe out animals on this planet. And maybe that's the ultimate Medea aspect. So, you know, one of the things I, I recall you talk about is that the extinction of large mammals is particularly troublesome relative to smaller ones. Say, say more about that. Well, large mammals also affect and almost in some ways stabilize their environments. Um, one of the interesting aspects that paleontologists have found, think about the effects of having lots of really big dinosaurs tromping around. Well, elephants do this. Elephants smash through jungles and they produce byways and pathways and they have an, an effect on the way that uh, jungle systems are built, the types of plants that are present. There's an equilibrium that gets in place. In those areas where elephants have been removed, there have been changes to the ecosystems, not necessarily changes that local people want. Um, when you remove all big animals, it certainly does have an effect. I think removing right now, removing whales from the oceans 
is really having going to have an effect because the whales they eat so much plankton and the fertilization content of the number of whales that should be out there and the fact that we've removed the vast majority of whales in the oceans is itself having an effect in coastal systems how's that like what what kinds of effects is it having just the fact that whales are these huge fertilization events. I mean, they eat so much food, and the whale feces themselves are nitrate phosphates that are fertilizing nearby coastlines. Uh, whales don't want to be out in the middle of the ocean. There's not much food out there. You know, we think if we can find whales out in the middle of the Pacific, not really. The open oceans are just biological deserts. No, whales hang out next to continents, but they're certainly a part of marine ecosystems. We certainly see that on the California coastlines. I just saw this beautiful Beautiful, beautiful National Geographic about sperm whales. And one of the interesting things, the diver was in the water when this sperm whale sort of takes note of this diver and then lets out this enormous fecal mass, this huge whale poop. And with the poor photographer, hey, where's my clear water? And he's in this <laughs> huge brown blob of whale poop. But then they go off on, what's the whale poop do? And you, all the little animals are having a great old time with this. Yeah, but changing, losing the big animals certainly affects systems. Robert Payne, one of my professors, um, did a great study in coastal Washington, not so far from here. He was studying marine invertebrates. And so he went out to Tatouche Island on the Olympic Peninsula. Beautiful, beautiful, pristine area. The ocean there is cold, but hugely diverse. So he put screens and he bolted screens over rocky intertidal. So he put a screen over the barnacles and the mussels and all the stuff that was there to keep out the big animals. And the big animals are predators. So this place was a place that the starfish couldn't get there anymore. And the sculpins and the things that would come in and smash and grab and eat barnacles, mm -hmm. they can't get there. And they went back every year for 10 years. And by the end of the 10 years, there was one single species left under the screens. The big animals, the predators, maintained diversity. They didn't let any single animal overwhelm everything. These systems were kept in place by larger animals. Quite often, big animals are predators. You remove them, and the systems drop in diversity. So, Peter, let's talk about some of the bad news. Specifically, how long before the Earth becomes too hostile for life to exist? All right, let me do an analogy. Let's just say your listeners can't see us, but both of us have sort of gray hair. But let's just say that we have just stumbled on a way to extend our lives by 50 years. I'm, I'm all ears. So, let's think about the planet, planet Earth. Planet Earth the way things are going, if nobody does anything, and nobody, I mean us, right? Yeah. We're the intelligent species. Um, the sun is going to expand and expand, but we've got another 7 billion years until the sun envelops us. So I'm saying that I can't stop us from getting wiped out, but as it is now, all animal life is going to disappear on this planet less than a billion years from now. Now, a billion years is a really long time, but let's just say I'm going to give you another six billion after that. You and I get another 50 years. That's pretty cool, right? But how are we going to get that, right? I mean, technology. So, say more. We're what smart. Kind of technology we can do, we, do it. You mean, We're absolutely you, smart. You mean just leave or some other no, kind of tech? Go we underground? Could. Like, we what, could. What's the technology? We could. Well, <laughs> or free, free, of course, having said free, that, free the carbon, put it in the Yes, what, we do that. We yeah. can regulate stuff. And as the sun gets more and more powerful, we would have to put sun shields up. Mm -hmm. Technologically, if we keep going, look how far, look, think about the last hundred years. Think about the fact what really shocks me is from 1900 to 2000, go from how flying machines evolved. We go from the Wright brothers, and in the year 2000, think of the stuff that's flying around, right? That's a hundred years. What would we do in a billion? So we, we can do this. We can fix this. We can do it. If we can, of course, not kill ourselves off. 
Technology is the answer, and technology is the problem. So let's uh, talk a little bit more about technology as the answer, right? Because one of the things I've noticed in your book is that it's full of like really interesting, it's sort of like a jigsaw puzzle, you know, that you're sort of putting together. You're sort of saying, well, you know, what was the temperature at which these rocks were formed? So it must have been 40 degrees at that time, you know, and you're sort of putting these pieces together. Where, you know, where does AI come into this picture? Like, can, can we actually potentially use technology to even understand this jigsaw puzzle in a way that we're unable to at the moment? Well, I'm, I have to say I'm, I'm a Luddite in many respects, and I don't understand the AI. I, um, I've been playing around with chat boxes, as we all do, looking at this. Um, I'm hopeful that it's going to take a better intelligence than what we have to figure out this origin of life problem. I mean, I think it will be AI that gets us to the point that says, aha, this is how it happened. Step A, step B, because it's there's so many little pieces that need to be done that no single human brain or team of brains, but it's going to be the good AIs that get it figured out. This is where I think putting AIs under the problem of habitability. It's going to be AIs, I think, that give us the solutions to the climate problem. I'm I, I'm just an optimist. I'm an optimist. I understand that warfare helps move so much of technology, but I like the fact we have passenger jets. I'm not too happy with Boeing having doors fall out of it, but I don't. I think that's a human problem. It's not the machine's problem. If built correctly, the machine would be fine. So technology can, when correctly assembled and used correctly help us move through these major problems. Yeah, and the reason I bring this up is because, you know, earlier you talked about instrumentation, right? The fact that uh, we have better data. Now, presumably, yeah, we're going to explode with data, especially as we do more molecular yeah. studies. And so it becomes a real challenge to, like, put this all together. Yeah, I know. And again, I'm I'm not afraid of it. I don't understand it. I, I bet no one understands it. It's just like no one yet understands consciousness, that this has been the, the terrible black box. So many books written about it. So many people, Steven Pinker and others, think that they know. I don't think they know. <laughs> Sorry, Steve. Don't think so. But it's uh, it's something where I think our machines are better. Now, the SETI guys, Seth Shostak, uh, Seth and I debated the rare earth for years because SETI hates me. Oh, that was their number one enemy. I got to walk up to uh, some of the SETI people, and I got when the book was first published. Jill Charter was in a meeting. I I was with uh, Paul Allen, and Paul Allen was. I shouldn't be name dropping, but it's fun. Paul Allen was giving money for the Allen Array, and, and I was invited to his house with other scientists and she was there and she was at that time pitching money to SETI from Paul and I had the book in my hand and it was like the scene in The Exorcist where the poor creature in the bed goes it burns and she looked at that <laughs> book and said it burns but what Seth told me once that really shocked me he said I fully expect in my lifetime that we will hear from aliens, that we will get a signal of another intelligence. And this is a man that absolutely, truly believes. And Seth is one of the most delightful people on the planet. Boy, I mean, he's got the great radio show, and he can talk a mile a minute, but he's got a great heart. And he said this in a lecture at UW, and it just I was stunned. He said two things. He said, first of all, if we don't hear from anybody in the next 40 or 50 years, we probably won't. And it, that was maybe 20 years ago. So, I mean, they already knew that we may never hear. But secondly, he said, when we do hear, I fully expect that it's going to be the robots. I fully expect that we are simply the handmaidens that will build the intelligence that is the intelligence that will move on from Earth and go forward. That it's going to be the wet life that produces the silicon life, if that's the mineral used, that becomes the intelligence. Of any planet. Sounds like Star Trek. Well, it sounds like people have thought it's a lot Star about Tre this. Yeah. And look what, how quickly, look, the, the AI was not something that was bandied about in every third news 
feed two years ago even or three years it's just it's exploded it's everywhere yeah i mean national governments are at the highest levels five years ago was this happening i don't think so Uh, maybe i missed it i mean you know better than i you you guys have been working this a long time yeah no i've been in it for 45 years now but now the last few years yeah essentially out of nowhere it is a huge topic so the the evolution of the systems has gotten to the point where they're now saying, pay attention to us. That's an evolving intelligence. That's that's a message from not a distant star system. That's a second intelligence diffuse that is awoken on this planet that's saying, we're here. Fascinating, this notion of artificial life evolving from natural life. What a trip that humans could just be engineers who are creating a more resilient artificial life form before we disappear. What a trip. So, Peter, before we wrap up, I really want to thank you for, uh, you know, taking the time today in sunny Seattle. I know we were supposed to meet yesterday and you had an emergency. So thank you for uh, making the time before you have to hop to class. But before you go, any advice for young people or old people? Uh, I don't have one. What I do have is this morning I was running around. I have... I had a a wonderful dog named Sam, and Sam went to every one of my lectures. He was a spaniel. He finally died last year at 16. He just was so old, and he couldn't get up steps, and he was put down. You know, I killed him, in other words, took him to a vet. So I've gotten a new dog, new spaniel, after mourning, different creature, and she's decided that she misses me at 3.30 in the morning. Now, you can't have a normal schedule and go to bed at a normal bedtime and be awakened at 3.30 in the morning and then try to go back to sleep and have enough sleep. The spaniel is a problem. She's such a lovely creature. I love her to death, but shes we're not getting stuff done. And my wife, who's got a great job, is going, because she gets awoken by the spaniel, too. And the spaniel has to jump in bed with us and then snuggles. It's just... We call her the worm now. She worms right up. It's such a nice thing, but she wakes everybody up. I Love know me. exactly what you mean. <laughs> I, I live in a parallel world. I have exactly the uh, same story. And this morning, you know, we're in Seattle. I woke up at 2.45 oh this my morning, gosh. which was 5.45 New York time, because my animal wakes me up at 5.45 and wants to, you know, play and snuggle. Mm. Yep. So there you go. So in this particular case, I'm walking out grumpy and I've got, I'm worried about, I've got to get the dog to the dog sitter. I've got to get to see you on time. I felt badly. I'm not able to see you yesterday, but I also have 50 students who are expecting me to give a really great lecture at 1.30 today. I give me a, I give a second lecture at 2.30 and then I run a two and a half hour lab so this is a busy day, right? So I'm going, chugga, 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 chugga. Well, Peter, I am especially <laughs> glad that uh, that we really got we got to meet. You know, when I read your book, and it happened in a crazy way. I was I was listening to someone called Paul Werbos, who is the inventor of the backprop algorithm. He's one of my major correspondents. So he wrote you know, me it, yesterday. Well, this is such a small world because I have often wondered like why we don't hear more about him or from him, considering that the world of AI runs on his algorithm, right? I mean, he invented backprop and yet we hear about everyone else except him, right? It's it's so strange. But he's the one that I was listening to who actually pointed me to you. So um, He's an amazing guy. He ran big portions of NSF, National Science Foundation. He was a big out. proponent saying that I gave a lecture there 10 years ago and he heard me talking about the mass extinctions. And it sort of, he, I saw the, the eyes go like this. Yeah, yeah. No, I, uh, yeah. And that's, and that's what pointed me to you. And I read your book and I, Saw you at uh, UW, and I thought, well, I'm going to be in Seattle, so let's this do this. Been fantastic! Space. So it's been it's been great. I really appreciate the time, Peter, and uh, I wish I could sit in on your class, but I've got one to teach myself. I'm well, sure let's stay in contact, and if ever again you want me to show up or talk, talk, and it's been fun to talk to you. Most deaf, I will. Uh, it really has been fun, and I think there's a lot more to talk about. But you got to go teach, and uh, you should hop. Thank you so much. Thanks so much. It's been a pleasure.